But yeah, we're, we plan on doing that last. Maybe we should have did that first. <laughs> yeah, but it would have been hard to kind of get the details of the components, maybe. Is that it? I don't know. I mean, at least at Jeep, he can skip it. I'm sorry. He's already here. Yeah, it's all the layers that I'm bringing up. Um, should we stop? Yeah. 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 Uh, my name is Pratik Jain. Um, I'm a PhD student with Dr. Shed. And I'm, I'm actually using the slides related to RDF from a pretty well-known textbook related to semantic web. So this will cover pretty much all the basics related to RDF, which is one of the most popular standards for representing metadata on the web as of now. And we will be covering uh, um, in one and a half hours three topics, so it's going to be a bit of an information overload. But it's RDF, then the querying language, which is used for most of the semantic web technologies, and the work which we guys do in the lab related to spatial and temporal analysis of data. Um, so why do we need semantic modeling? Uh, why is, what are the deficiencies which, uh, which are present in the web because of which there is a requirement of semantic web modeling? The web, as most of us have seen, it's typically, it was created for human consumption. The pages were written in HTML, which a human being can read, process, and understand the information which was present over there. But the problem with that approach was that there was too much of information which was present, and it becomes really, really difficult for any human being to sit and understand everything which is present over there. Now, because we are employing machines in pretty much every aspect of our life, so people thought, why, why not involve a lot of machines in processing this huge amount of data? But again, the way in which the web was structured, the HTML, it is not really suitable for the way um, in which machines can process it. It is really ambiguous. It relies on using a lot of background knowledge, which a human being can provide, but a machine cannot. So that is why they had to come up with a new standard. But then the question which arises in our mind is, why not use XML for this particular purpose? So let's see if we can try to do a simple thing in XML. If I have to express a statement that the book Foundations of Semantic Web Technologies is published by CRC Press, we have multiple options for doing the same thing. There is one option in which I can represent the publisher as a child element of published, and then make book as its own independent element. And the second option is where both publisher and the book, the, the publisher name and the book become attributes of the publish and publisher and published element. So it l leads to a lot of ambiguity. You can represent the tree structure in a lot of ways because of which it will be extremely difficult if you want to write any kind of programs or softwares to process this information. Okay, so the uh, people came up with a new way of um, linking the data together, where a lot of the publicly available data sets, I'm sorry, it's not very clear, but a lot of publicly available data sets, uh, such as the CIA fact book, then uh, the RDF representation of Wikipedia, which is popularly known as DBpedia, a lot of geographical information in the form of geonames, uh, dictionary information in the form of WordNet, etc., were made available online for people to use. And people thought that maybe this, all this information should be best represented in the form of RDF because it makes it much more easier to process this massive amount of data which is available on the internet. So in RDF, instead of representing things as trees, which is pretty much what goes on when you are using kind of XML, 
the, the solution is to represent things as graphs because it becomes a lot easier. The representations are less ambiguous instead of using XML. So if I have to you represent the same information which was there on the previous slide, that there is a particular book which has a particular publisher, it becomes a very straightforward task. I make a node which represents the URI of the book, and then I have a property which talks about who is the publisher, and then the next thing is the, the actual value of the publisher. If there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt me in between. Sure. RDF doesn't necessarily mean OWL, though, does it? Can you, can you use RDF without using OWL? So um, there is one particular serialization of OWL, which is RDF XML serialization. But RDF doesn't mean OWL. OWL is more a way of representing many of the logical things which are constraints and stuff. Exactly. Okay. So if, you, if you're used to maybe the database kind of terminology, OWL um, can be thought of maybe more as kind of a single level of information, whereas RDF would be representation of the data. So could you use RDF without using OWL? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, also, uh, uh, RDF, uh, there is also schema uh, definition for RDF for RDFS. Okay. So, six between, uh, so you don't have to use all many data and things, you do need a six schema. And uh, for, so, for that, RDFS is available. Uh, so, you can have classes and you know, instance of classes and things of like that. Owl uh, is more richer, uh, is richer rather. And uh, if you, particularly if you're going to use constraints, you're going to use R as an example. Um, my, my view is that much, much, much larger amount of use of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of this semantic technology is happening with the use of RDF. And much smaller is happening with R. So indeed, uh, not only um, uh, you may use RDF alone, but that's probably the uh, broader use of uh, these technologies right now. Okay. Uh, and uh, there are, you know, what you can do, the reasoning you can do is somewhat limited because of the modeling, uh, you know, richness is limited in RDF, RDFS. Uh, OWL has one more additional type of, you know, reasoning where you can do subsumption based reasoning or you can do basically one whereby. <laughs> And that one that looks into the constraint and things like that. So basically, the inferencing is what you do with our um, the applications in which that is very critical. Uh, in my view, this is also you are not sure if this, but is smaller than the um, uh, cases in which you can already exploit the richness of RDF. The most important thing about RDF, uh, by far, is um, the fact that you have labeled relationships. So as um, Sorry, labeled relations. Like over here, like published uh, by. Yeah. Yep, yep. And um, uh, that is where the real semantics is. That's where the meaning is. So to the extent that those uh, you know, labels are given meaningfully or meaningfully and exploited to uh, And as uh, Pratik mentioned, um, uh, it, you know, you, you can think about data structure as tree, which is limited compared to graph, and particularly label graph, in terms of expressiveness. Yes, there is more expression than this, which is out, but this is uh, useful in its own right quite a bit. And the other problem which comes the moment you try to use always ontologies is the amount of time which it takes for processing a lot of data and all that. So when you want to do inferencing, the speed of these things um, so, okay, there's more expressiveness, but then uh, these are all known to be not, uh, you know, hard, complete, complex problems. Even the graph problems are in RDF because some of the processing is, you know, in principle, graph oriented processing. And that itself is complex. The other one gets even more. So, yeah. Okay. Ah. So, um, you were saying that XML has this associated mm -hmm. with the right? Mm -hmm. This is expressed in uh, passive voice. You can also say one uh, minor ambiguous point here is that you could say CRST press published this book. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a start type of thing uh, around the CRST press, you would have a fan. Well, usually what happens is when you model all this information, there is always a schema which is behind the scene for you. So if in the schema, if you have modeled that 
publisher publishes a book, then it's going against the schema. But can't we do the same XML? Have a quick schema and get rid of I don't think XML enforces the kind of properties like this goes in a specific direction. XML can enforce data types and all that, but I'm not sure if it can enforce directions. So basically you don't have the, you don't have the uh, relationship as first class object in XML. XML. Right. So you look at this published by a simple as that. It's not a tree. It's not a tree. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Uh, so RDF, um, we have used the abbreviation till now. It basically stands for Resource Description Framework. And it's a W3C recommendation um, for quite a while now. It's a specific, uh, like the question which you asked, it's a specific data model. It is not a specific syntax. It's a way of modeling things. It's not a way of encoding things in, a, in, in using a specific syntax. It was uh, originally designed for providing metadata or additional information for any kind of resources which are available on the web. Like if you can think of web pages, then some of the metadata which naturally comes into mind are authors, creation date, what's the size of that page, and so on. And later on, people started using it for more general purposes, such as representing the entire content of the information itself, not just the metadata. It encodes the structure of the information, that is how the information is originally represented, what are the relationships, how, what is the directionality of the relationships, and so on. And it's pretty much a universal machine readable format because a lot of times at the back end you're using XML, so that, that also helps in making it machine readable in an easy way. So what are the building blocks for a particular RDF graph, which we saw like two slides before this? So the things which you need are URIs, literals and blank notes. Now, as we are all familiar, URIs are pretty much, they can be used for denote, denoting anything which you want to represent on the web. So that forms a major component of this graph. Then the second thing which we need are the literals, which are sort of the, the actual values of these properties, like um, the, if, 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 my name was a, if my name is a string, then that becomes the literal in this case, representing um, the year is 2009, so 2009. And then sometimes we also have to use blank nodes, which are empty nodes, or which are sometimes represented as B nodes. So if you see that um, format written anywhere, then please treat it as blank nodes. So if we look at this particular graph, then in this particular case, the oval which you see over here that is your URI. There is a particular way for representing all this information in the graphs. So the oval always represents the URI. And only the URIs can be the subject. We'll come to this in more detail, but they, can, they are the only things which can be the subject of, of a particular statement. Then the properties are, again, they are URIs. However, the object of any particular statement it can be a URI, it can be a literal, or it can be a blank node. Uh, URI, as most of us are familiar, it basically stands for the Uniform Resource Identifier. It allows for denoting resources on the World Wide Web. So if I have to uh, denote myself using a URI, then pretty much I can have a website, or I can have a namespace reserved for myself, and that will denote me, because information related to me can be accessed over there, or it may not be. <coughs> And resources, um, as the term we have been using, it can be anything which possesses a clear identity. Like me as an individual, I have an identity because I have a particular social security number, I have a particular university ID, and so on. But if you think of it, my name, which is Pratik, a lot of people can share that particular name. So that kind of helps you in distinguishing what is a UI versus what is a literal. So if there is a clear identity of any entity, then it is a URI. However, if that thing can be shared by multiple objects like names or numerical values, dates, etc., then they typically should be literals. Uh, examples of URIs can be books, because every book has a particular ISBN number, cities, because a lot of these cities, they will have some internal coding format where a numerical code is assigned to them. Humans, like I said, uh, most of the citizens have a social security number. Then publishers, because again, they will have a particular taxpayer ID and so on. And this particular concept has already been realized in a lot of domains, such as 
the ISBN number for books, which I just mentioned. Um, it, the URIs, uh, they pretty much build on the concept of URL. Everybody accesses internet over here, so the thing which you type on your address bar, that becomes a URL. It builds on that particular concept. And a lot of times, the URL of document is also used at its, as its URI. Um, the URI, it starts with the URI schema, which is separated by the semicolon, as we have seen a lot of times, HTTP colon, and so on. And they are often hierarchically organized. Like, I work for Noesis, so Noesis will be sort of the parent thing in the URI representing me. Then within that, I am a student, so then there will be a student, and then finally will be my name within that. So there is, uh, typically, if you want to have a well-organized structure, there should be this kind of a hierarchy which should be thought about. Um, Self-defined URI is uh, where you start defining by yourself a particular URI. Let's say you do not do not have a domain name, but you still want to work on documents, or you want to have information represented using URIs. In those cases, you can represent uh, you can create your own URIs, and then you can start uh, representing the information um, using that. However, the best strategy is to use HTTP URIs, and it's, uh, the best scenario is if you have a web space which you control, like a domain name which you own or something like that. So if, you, if somebody clicks on a particular resource which you have represented, he can get more information related to it. Now, how do, you rep how do you distinguish the URI of a resource from the associated documents describing it? Like, how do I distinguish that this is my URI versus a URI which is giving more information about me? So as for, in this particular case, if you have, let's say, a URI for Othello, then do not use this, this kind of a URI. Because what it is doing is it's, it's representing the uh, uh, it is representing the document which is describing it. If you want to represent the resource, then what you should be doing is you should be using something called put a hash after that and then put something like URI. So this makes it absolutely clear that this is just an identifier for that. However, this gives you the precise information about the entity. Now, what I was mentioning as literals, so they are used for representing data values or things which do not have their own identity by themselves, or things which cannot possess any more properties. Typically, they are written down as strings. You can also have them as um, any of the XML data types which are used, like decimals, integers, etc., date values. Um, they are interpreted via the assigned data type. So, if you will be using XML, then you will be specifying that I'm using XML string, and then it will be treated like um, as a string. If you say I'm using XML decimal, then it will be treated as a decimal. Uh, however, if you do not specify any kind of information, then it will be treated as a string. It will not be treated as anything else. Now, let's come to something which is blank node, which is kind of a uh, confusing topic for a lot of people. but. It's used to state existence of an entity where the reference of that particular entity is not yet known. Like, let's say that um, I'm a publisher, but I do not own a website, or I do not own a URI of my own. So how do I represent this particular information? So the way in which I do it is I will create a blank note for myself, but I do know my name. So what I'll do is I'll have a property called name, and then there will be information about the press. Uh, the press name, which which represents my name. So what is the URI of the blank note? The the blank note doesn't get a URI, right? So uh, to go there, so what are the issues of going to the um, objects that are connected to blank notes? Because I mean, multiple blank notes. Right. right? So blank notes, um, even when you are using any of the RDF processing softwares. It becomes often confusing because uh, different blank notes can be interpreted in the same way. They can be interpreted in different ways as well. Like a lot of softwares, they treat, it, treat them in different ways. A lot of softwares, they treat, treat them in the same way. Like imagine if you have another graph which uses another blank note, and you are writing a software to process all publishers. Then in that particular case, um, the best uh, thing to do is to probably figure out from the from the documentation of the software or something that how it treats how what is the behavior of the blank note does it treats the two blank notes identically or it treats them differently 
um, graphs as triple sets. Now, so in this slide, we saw that if I have to represent any particular statement that there is a particular book whose publisher is CRC Press. Now, if let's say I want to make another statement about the book, that the book is available for sale on Amazon. So what I'll, I can do is I can start combining these triple statements which I have and start making a complete graph. Because if I have to add another property to it, like in this case there is a property called title, then it comes over here. If I, when there was a statement called published by, so there was another node which represented the publisher and it had its own name. So if I start combining all these things, then it pretty much leads to an entire graph. And I can represent all the information which I have available with me to represent it as the graph. Um, these RDF triples, um, they are basically the, the constituents. Um, uh, their constituents are three things which I mentioned before, which are the subject, predicate, object. Um, if um, in very elementary English grammar, they always teach you uh, subject is the thing about which a statement is made, and predicate is the thing what is being said about that particular subject. It follows entirely the same philosophy. Subject is the thing about which you are making a statement. Like in this particular case, you're making a statement that there is this particular URI about which I want to say that it is published by a particular publisher. So it's following the, it's following the same philosophy as probably most of us learned in our early schooling. And like I mentioned, terms, the term is inspired by the English linguist, but it doesn't always coincide because I don't think that there was any discussion of thing called object which represents the value for that particular property or predicate. Um, like I said before, the subject could be a URI or a blank node. The predicate has to be a URI. However, the object, it could be a URI, it could be a blank node, or it could be a literal. The reason it can be a URI is because if, let's say, I have to make a statement that my advisor is Dr. Shedd, then he has his own identity, he has his own associated properties, and so on. So that is why it is necessary that the object can be a URI. Now, the problem with making a literal as a subject is that, like I said, fundamentally, a literal is something which does not have its own properties or its own characteristics. So that is why it cannot be a subject. Now, coming to syntaxes which are used for representing this RDF information, uh, RDF model, there are multiple ways in which you can represent this information. One of the syntax which is used is called turtle. It was uh, designed by the same person who invented the web, or who's called the father of web, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He's also known as the father of semantic web. So the turtle notation is, um, he came up with this notation so that it becomes much easier for humans to read this particular syntax. Because if you're trying to read through XML, then it's, it's a big pain. It's, it's very, very difficult to figure out what is written over there. But if you look over here, it is fairly straightforward that there is a particular URI which represents a book which is published by another uh, entity which is a publisher. Then I have to make another statement about the same URI that it has a title which is foundation of semantic web technologies. So using three things, I'm able to convey any statement which I want. And that is pretty much the foundation of RDF. It's the notion of these triples which are represented using the subject predicate and these objects. Now, in, in the turtle syntax, the unabbreviated URIs, um, if you're familiar with XML, then you know that you can pretty much shorten, uh, you can represent the namespaces on the top of the file, and then you can continue to use the abbreviation by putting a colon and then the entity which you want to represent later on. So, however, if, if it's an unabbreviated URI, in case of turtle, then it's fully expanded and it's within these angular brackets. The literals are always enclosed in double quotes. So if you are seeing any entity, like over here, it represents the name, so it's present in double quotes. And extra spaces and line breaks outside of names are irrelevant. The system, most of the turtle processors will just completely ignore any line breaks, any spaces which are present. Uh, this gives like a complete description of it. So over here, again, we have defined 
that there is a um, prefix book. So over here, what they are doing is actually instead of representing the URIs over and over again, like XML, it has been defined as a prefix, and then it's used again. So I define my book namespace as so, and then I can go ahead and use it again and again. So what it allows me to do is it removes a lot of the redundancy. And if I, let's say, if I have to change my namespace, if let's say the book uh, moved from semantic-web to semantic-web-book.org, so it's going to reflect in the entire document and any place where this document is used. So that's one of the advantage which you will get if you use the prefix notation. Um, now, the other important thing about this particular syntax is that, again, to remove redundancy, the repeated subjects may be left out. If I have two consecutive statements which are using the same kind of subject, like in this case, book URI, if it's used again, like it was used in this slide, then I can just leave out the subject in this particular case. And the processor will interpret as that it is the same subject which is being used. So it will interpret it as book URI as a title, Foundations of Semantic Web Technologies. And several objects can be assigned to the same subject predicate pairs. Um, to exemplify, if a particular book has multiple authors, then you can use a comma, and then you can list down all the authors which are involved in the object. Like I mentioned before, there is also an XML syntax for representing the RDF. And because it becomes really difficult to read and figure out as to, uh, this is a pretty small chunk, but if it gets larger, it gets really difficult to read what's going on. So you can represent it even using the XML syntax. So what goes on over here is that your um, this is kind of the, the root element of this entire chunk. So this represents your subject, like the previous graph, if you'll compare it over here, where there is a book URI. So this is your subject. This title represents that this subject over here has this particular title. And this, which is, in, which is which serves as the value, it becomes the object in this particular case. Now, if I have to represent another, um, uh, another statement which talks about who is the publisher of that book, and again, I have to use a URI in that case, then it becomes a nested element over here. So I represent that there is a property called published by, and it actually refers to this particular URI. Um, RDF pretty much exploits all possible data types which are available in XML, like the XST data types, you know, like string, decimal, integer, and so on. Uh, before, what they used to do is they used to put it in double quotes, and then everything was treated as string, which became a problem. Which became a problem in a lot of cases, like if there was any kind of mathematical software and it was looking for integers, but what was available was strings. So that became sort of a problem. Uh, data types which are denoted by URIs can be freely chosen. I mean, there is no restriction on, on for that. And the syntax for type literal, let's say if I want to say that my 10 is an integer, then what I'll do is I'll put the value of 10 over here, then there will be quotes, and then there will be these double carriage signs, and then I'll say it's an XST integer. Um, the only data type which uh, RDF standard came up by itself was the RDF XML literal data type. And it denotes arbitrary balanced XML snippets by themselves. Uh, so if, if we have to like sort of kind of look at a mapping which takes them from the lexical, lexical space to the value space, then over here 3.14 represents the 3 comma 14 in the value space. And uh, then similarly, this one goes to 2 comma 5 and so on. So uh, I can't remember the exact word for it, but like you know, with a decimal number like precision or whatever, it's not storing that point oh oh, is it? It's not uh, storing that first bit, like 100 point oh oh. Okay. It only stores the 100? It the only stores the 100. Okay. But, I mean, if let's say that, uh, anyways, I mean, the zeros are anyways ignored, anything which is present over here. But let's say in this particular case it was 3.14, then it's going to represent it as 3,14. So your precision after the decimal is maintained, but the only thing which is it, it's ignoring are the zeros. You can, can you add anything to that? Okay. 
Uh, so again, over here, if I have to represent this particular thing using the, uh, if this is the graph which I have, then the particular turtle syntax for representing the same graph will be the following. So there is an RDF primer, which is possibly the best source if you want to learn about RDF. This is the actual URI for that uh, primer. And it has a specific publication date, and it has a title which is RDF primer and so on. So the RDF, uh, the turtle syntax for the same is that there is a particular prefix which represents this uh, entire namespace, and then this is the subject, this RDF primer, and this has a particular property which is the title and RDF primer, and then there is a particular publication date which is associated with it. Uh, there are various language settings and data types which can be present. Um, so language settings, they only apply to the untyped literals, uh, where it is not specified that, hey, it's an XST integer or XST decimal. Let's say that you want to collaborate with some of your Danish partners. Then uh, it can be present even in their language. So over here, it's an example where people, uh, the, the French language is, is being used, so that is why it represents at the rate of FR. Which, sort, which is sort of an abbreviation for French. And then this is used for English. So it can be used for uh, representing information in various languages. And that is why it's sort of helped in becoming a global standard for representing metadata. Uh, now, what happens in those cases that, where I want to represent n array relation, relationships? Um, Let's say if I want to write down the recipe for cooking my favorite, favorite Indian dish, which is for the preparation of chutney, we need the following. We need some mangoes, we need some peppers, and so on. If I was representing it as a database, then I'll have the name of the dish over here, I'll have the ingredients over here, and what is the, what is the amount which I'm using. So if I have to represent it, I can use some blank nodes to represent the same information that there is this chutney which has this ingredient, and this ingredient has green mangoes, which, is, which has a specific amount, kind of amount. And again, if I'll have to represent that it also has um, um, peppers, then I'll have another property which is going out of it, and then again, I'll say the same thing for the amount which is being used. So for representing these kind of things, where there is there are a lot of entities which are involved, such as lists, over here, like we saw, there, um, there is actually an entire list of things which is present. Go ahead. Sorry, can you just go over the, the blank mode again? Sure. So because what we had to say was that um, this particular uh, dish requires two ingredients. One is mango, and the other one is pepper. So the best, uh, w the one of the ways of representing it is to say that um, this particular dish has these ingredients. And this becomes a blank node for me. Because if I make it a particular node, let's say if I put mangoes over here. Is it a placeholder? You can think of it as a placeholder. For those two specific? Uh, see, the problem if, if you will try to interpret it as a placeholder is okay. next, 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 next question would be what is the value of that placeholder? Right. So that is why I think it will be a bit confusing or a bit difficult to think of it as a placeholder. Instead of it, think of it as a way of solving information uh, represented in scenarios where you need to represent a lot of things related to something which is uh, a lot of things connected to one simple thing, single thing. Because think of it, if I ignore this or if I remove this blank node, then the way in which I'll be doing it is I'll have one um, node coming, uh, I'll have one edge coming out of this um, dish, representing that it's a green mango. Then I'll have another one coming out of it from mango, which will talk about the amount. Then I'll have another edge coming out of it, which will represent the peppers. And then I'll have another node coming out of it, which will represent the amount. So that sort of makes it a bit problematic, and uh, it's probably not the best way to represent that information as well. Go ahead. So it's probably, I think, because of this, the amount of slides which was present over uh, space. But if you have to represent pepper, then what you can do is you can connect another edge out of it, and you can do the same thing. But uh, the, the, 
actually this example is the motivation for kind of coming to the actual thing, um, the solution which they offer in terms of lists and all that. So there are special data structures in RDF which are called lists or containers. So um, there are different kinds of, um, if you have multiple things related to something, then there are things which are containers and collections. There is a, a, a big difference between the two. And then there is also something which is called the RAFI triples. Uh, so containers are basically open lists where there is no specific ordering. It's like um, putting a bunch of candies in a jar. They don't have any specific ordering. And you can um, take them out in any order which you want. You can put them in any order which you want. So over here, if you'll see, then um, there are multiple authors for this particular book. So what we do over here is we have three properties. And um, the three properties are listed over here, uh, along with the uh, URIs which represent their object. And then there is a particular thing which represents the date. Now, using RDF type, what we can do is we can assign a list type to represent what kind of a collection is it. It's an ordered collection or if it's an unordered collection. If it's an ordered collection, then it becomes something which is called a sequence. It's like uh, arranging people in a line based on their increasing heights. Then that becomes, uh, so you say that, hey, something is a sequence, and then you give, it, give that particular sequence a particular name, and then you put the information in the order which you want. Then there is another thing which is called a bag which is um, like the collection of people in this room. Anybody came in any order, people can leave in the order which they want. So that is sort of the unordered collection or the unordered list. And then there is an alternative, like uh, let's say if I want to make a statement that I will have either Indian food or Mexican food. So how do I give these kind of choices? So that is represented using something which is called the alternative. Um, now, the close list or collections is something which is um, over here uh, represented. OK, so here there is a particular ordering. Like, this is a particular first element, then this is, um, and so on. And then the, the rest is followed over here, which is not present at all. And then there is a specific abbreviation which can be used about it in, in turtle as well. I don't know how to explain it in a much better way, uh, close list. I'll probably get back what about that. Final? I'm sorry? What is the final? Final is basically it says that uh, the list ends over here. That's it. Uh, now, let's say if I want to make a statement about another statement, that <coughs> there is an example that the detective supposes that the butler killed the gardener. So over here, there is, you can think of it as two different statements. One is that the butler killed the gardener. And the detective is supposing that this particular thing happened. So the way in which we represent it is that we first of all come up with the statement, which is the butler has killed the gardener. We make a statement representing it. And then we make another statement which connects the detective using a property to this entire statement itself. This is something which is known as reification. Um, so so uh, both these reification and uh, black nodes are frequent discussed topics. So say a little more about this reification. Uh, so reification, like Dr. Shit said, they are frequently discussed topics along with blank nodes. The, one of the reasons why they frequently discussed it, for a lot of softwares, it becomes difficult to process these reified statements. If you're making a statement about a statement and so on. Because they are not able to understand as to what's going on, like what is the original statement about which statement is being made, and let, what happens if in case people start making statement about a statement about a statement. Like there will be an, just a massive amount of depth which will be involved in all that. So that kind of becomes a problematic thing. And then again, how do you model this, this thing? Like people can come up with various modeling strategies where they say, hey, you know what? Maybe reification is not the best particular, best possible way to represent this thing. Instead of that, I can probably break it apart into triples itself. But the moment you will try to do that, you will probably end up having more triples and a lot of redundancies which are involved. So there are 
positive side to it, it makes your life simple. The flip side is that processing using a lot of these softwares is a bit problematic if, if your data is rarefied. And in a lot of cases, rarefication um, involves often blank nodes. And already there is a problem associated with blank nodes on top of that. If rarefication is added, it makes it even more difficult. Uh, now, RDF is pretty much focused on uh, representing the information, being able to transfer it to, other, um, to others, having a common format for representing this information. But like we were discussing before, with the question which you had about all-based reasoning and all that. So even RDF uh, supports limited f form of that. You can use entailment, and um, uh, you can come up with some minor reasoning uh, things, but not a whole lot. And if we have to support it, then definitely there's some kind of a formal semantics which is required in order to support all this. Because without a formal background, reasoning will be almost impossible. So what we do is they have defined a lot of uh, these interpretations, the committee which sat down and defined these RDF syntaxes and all that. So they have defined interpretations for some of these things. Uh, now, over here, it's broken down into two different uh, chunks. One is the vocabulary, and then the second thing is the interpretation of that particular vocabulary. So in the vocabulary, there are things such as the names, the literals, then there are untyped and typed, and then there is a set of URIs which are involved over here. Over here, it maps down to specific things, like the untyped and the type, they map to the, the resources. The URIs, they can, again, go to the resources, or they can even go to the properties. However, the things which are just the literals, they have to map only to the, um, the, the literals. When a, particular okay. when a particular triple becomes valid for interpretation and when it is not valid, uh, the thing to say is probably that a graph becomes valid, that first of all, a graph becomes valid only if its triples are valid. If I am saying that I'm representing astronomical information in a graph, and if I start making a statement that the sun rises from the west, then that makes that particular graph invalid because there is a specific triple which is invalid. Now that leads to a question like, how do I figure out that, hey, this particular triple is valid or not? For that, there is, like I said, that there are things which are in, uh, you can do limited amount of entailment, and then there you can do limited amount of reasoning to figure out all that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, again, the, uh, using RDF versus using all is that the amount of entailment which is supported by RDF is fairly limited. It is not as rich or as detailed as all based entailment. And it's basically graph matching with um, blank nodes being matched for wildcards, something what you were asking me a few minutes ago. Um, as for example, in this particular case, this graph, which is which we have, that there is a book which is published by um, a particular publisher. It just simply entails this particular graph and nothing else. Uh, now, RDF in itself, like uh, it has a particular schema which is associated with it. Uh, so it allows for specification of the the lot of the factual data or the grounded entities, as we call it. But what we want to do is, um, because RDF represents information about individuals, we want to have information to be encoded about groups of entities or groups of individuals. Like making a statement about humans, that human beings have blood, human beings have hairs, and so on. So instead of associating this particular thing with every individual which is present in, in, in your knowledge base, what you can do is you can represent it at the level of the schema. So any entity which becomes um, an instance of uh, a corresponding uh, class in the schema, it will automatically have those properties because its parent class has that particular property. And RDF schema is, again, it's part of the RDF W3C recommendation. Um, like I used the term classes, so it's um, classes are something similar to if you have used any of the object-oriented programming, um, you can compare it. It's not really the same, but 
it will help you at least in better understanding that if I have in Java a particular class which says that there is something which is called a human, then I can associate a lot of attributes with that human. It can, in a way, um, uh, kind of map to that. That I can make a class representing books, I can associate properties with that particular book, that a book has publisher, a book has a name, and a book can have a particular subject. So the moment I make an instance for that particular book, I can say that uh, the, the instance of that particular book will also have a publisher, it will also have an ISBN number, it will also have a subject. And how do I say that uh, uh, there is a, the book, um, book number one, is an instance of the class book? I do that using something which is called RDF type. This basically represents what is the class of the entity which, uh, which is present over here. Again, it's in the format of subject, predicate, and object, or subject, property, and object. So this is the subject about which I'm making a statement that there is a particular book. The property is the type, and it represents that it is of class which is enjoyable. Uh, now let's say if I want to say that uh, every geography book is also a kind of book. Now, the reason why I want to say it is so that if somebody creates instances of geography books, then again they will have all the properties. So even within schema, I can have properties. So I can say that over here, let's say they're saying that textbook is a subclass of book. So the moment you do that, what happens is that anything which is a textbook automatically inherits all the properties which are associated with the book. And what you can also do is you can associate additional properties with this textbook. So you can make another statement that a textbook has, um, uh, has applicable students, uh, high school kids or college kids and so on. So automatically any instance of that particular class will have those properties as well. Uh, the RDF subclass property is defined as transitive and reflexive. So if I will make another statement which is um, a college textbook is a subclass of textbook, automatically it is considered that it also has its, it has two parent classes. One is a textbook and the other class is a book because of transitivity. And then there are certain notations um, which can help you in understanding that RDF type in set notation basically means the epsilon sign, and if in case the subclass of basically it's the subset of notation which is being used. Uh, the property which we have discussed in a lot of detail till now, it's basically a technical term for the relations or the correspondences, and then the property names are usually predicate positions in the in the RDF triples. Um, like uh, mathematically, if I have to represent them, then I can say, let's say if I have a property called married with, then I can uh, represent it as a set, and then the entities which are involved in this set will be uh, using this particular property. Like Adam and Eva, Ma Adam is married with Eva, Brad is ma married with Angelina, and so on. Um, similar to the subclass of relationship, you can also have sub-property relationship. So if you have uh, married with sub-property of married, happily married with is a sub-property of married with, so anything which is associated with married with can um, automatically become part of happily married with. Or if you say that um, Adam and Eva are happily married with each other, it automatically means that they are also married with each other. Um, now let's say if I want to say that uh, there is a particular property that uh, if I if I have a particular statement that human beings are um, uh, human beings have uh, social security numbers or something like this, then how do I make sure that the property uh, of have its subject is always a human being? <coughs> and its object is always a social security number. How do I enforce this particular thing? So what I can do is I can associate properties because basically they are URIs, they are, they are even resources by themselves. So what I can do is I can even make statements about them. So I make two statements about them. One is what is the domain, and one is what is the range. If you're familiar with functions, then every function has a particular domain and it has its own range. 
domain is what goes as input and uh, range is what comes as the output of that particular function or the set of entities which can be the output. It's something similar to that. Uh, what you can have over here is when you have a domain, then this only publication can be the subject of the property published by. So only a book should technically appear as a subject of published by or a publication should appear as a subject of published by and not a human being or not a car or not an aircraft. Uh, aircraft. And published by, again, it can, I can represent that its range is a publisher. So only a publisher can show up as the object of this particular property and not any other university or something like that. Uh, using this, the, a lot of the dependencies between properties and classes can be specified as to what are the classes which participate in a particular relationship, what classes cannot participate in a particular relationship. Uh, they, uh, these property restrictions, they are interpreted globally and they are represented uh, in a conjunction. So in this particular example, if you see that there is an author of a uh, property which has its range cookbook and then there is an author of another author of property which has its range storybook, that basically means that in order to be a participant and author of property, somebody has to be both uh, write a cookbook as well as a storybook. So if you're making any of these kind of statements, then make sure that it's represented as an and. It is not or. You can also add a lot of information in English to give additional uh, information about the data sets which you have so that it becomes easier for people to understand. And uh, you can, let's say that um, you can use RDFS label, which is another property, to assign an alternative name. Let's say if I want to call that United USA is United States of America, so you can use this particular property. If I want to give a comment that uh, about any particular resource, then I can use this particular uh, property. It basically helps in explaining the resource in more detail that United States of America is a country, North America continent, and so on. So instead of machine, if a human being is looking at it, it becomes uh, easier. And even in case of machines, if let's say you want to display additional information about that particular thing, then maybe this is one of the places where you can look for that. RDFS C also defined by these, these are the properties which can be used for point, giving pointers to additional information. That let's say if I want to uh, give information about Michael Jackson, then I can also point to uh, somebody who is, uh, are the class of entities which are singers or pop singers and so on. So this helps in giving pointers or additional links to information which can be used in addition to what you already have. Um, we've already kind of discussed this. Uh, uh, the RDF, RDFS entailment, the basis for that is almost um, like a rule like deduction calculus. Um, I won't go into details of this. this is, um, we have discussed some things related to it, but this is basically a representation for the same thing. What we discussed, like, um, it's hard to read, but there is a subclass of which is, um, uh, there is U which is subclass of V, and then there is V which is subclass of Z, then it automatically entails that V is a subclass of X. Go ahead. What is RDFS entailment? RDFS entailment is basically um, being able to infer additional facts using the information which you already have. Let's say that I have a statement that uh, I am a student, and then there is another statement which, uh, or there is a schema level information which says that student is a human, then being able to infer that I am a human. For extracting more exactly. information from the Cory, uh, can you add more to that? Because of so RDFS um, as a um, adds a bit of schema information to the RDF, which allows you to keep this much um, in and I think there's like maybe 17 or so rules that RDF defines that allows you to do this kind of reason. Earlier in one of his slides, mm -hmm. you showed that some RDF uh, ripple or something and they simply entail something else. Yeah, that was just uh, in that particular case, the, the, no, the, the way in which they were using the phrase entailment was basically just saying that, hey, this represents this particular thing. Well, that's different. That is, this is more like, you can say, a kind of reasoning. Okay. That was just sort of a representation. 
and uh, there are other ways for defining the RDFS semantics. You can represent it into first order logic. The problem with first order logic is that you cannot represent things like, uh, which I was giving an example, like SST data types, uh, saying that there is a particular number 10, then this is a string, and so on. This is, again, a conversion of RDF triples into first-order logic. Now, RDF, because it has become so popular in representing um, a lot of this uh, metadata information on the web, there are plenty of tools which help you in handling RDF data. Uh, one of the more popular ones is something which is by the HP lab. It's called Jenna. Then there, is, uh, then there are things like OpenLink Virtuoso. Uh, most of these tools, the good thing about them is they are open source tools. Even uh, some of the commercial softwares like Oracle, they have support for uh, a lot of these um, RDF-based um, RDF syntaxes and processing of this RDF data, representing it as a graph and so on. Some of them may be a bit slower, but um, still there is plenty of support which is available for these. There are um, commercial RDF triple stores, open source RDF triple stores, and so on. So um, to sum it up, it's like RDF, it allows for modeling of the, uh, a lot of the semantic aspects of a domain, like saying who is the author and any kind of properties which are associated with entities. And it can be seen as a lightweight ontology language. Uh, uh, like we discussed before, if you have to use more aspects, then probably the best thing to do is to probably use all, although it becomes a lot of uh, complexity and slowness. There are some shortcomings of RDF, like any other language. Um, like, as for example, over here it says speaks with has a domain homo. Homo is a subclass of primates. It will not entail speaks with has a domain primates. It will lead to this particular problem. And if um, there is, uh, you want to say that uh, an animal cannot have a social security number. You cannot say those kind of things in RDF. Ne expressing negative information is a bit problematic in RDF. Um, that's about RDF. Any questions related to RDF? Sure. So um, the expressivity of uh, all, mm -hmm. uh, is it superior to RDF? Is it like a superset? I mean, it allows you to do more <laughs> reasoning based things and you can do it's it's even its expressivity is more because you can say things like there is a particular class which is an intersection of two classes there is a particular class which is a union of two classes and all that some things which are difficult with rdf i think it's a very interesting it is a question on, on, on a very simplistic term you can say the following um, that um, so our, you know, initially came up with three variants. One was our light, our DL, and our code. Mm -hmm. And uh, our light essentially was a syntactic variant of RDF. RDF. So, um, and that is the uh, least expressive of the one, which are in a way the one DL is more construct, the other is even more in to specify uh, things that are full for sort of logic output. So and clearly our DL is a subset thereof. And you know you you know this hierarchy of logic kind of stuff, and you know, second order logic and so on and so forth, right? So it, 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 in, a, in a simpler answer to this would be simply to say, well, RDF is a subset of ours. There is a little more to that in a, from a practical perspective, and and that is the following. Um, and in years of I've been in this data modeling since seventy, so uh, or rather eighty, so. Uh, if you want to model more, you have to do more work, you have to have more knowledge of the domain and you have to do it more consistently. And um, the cost of doing that can be substantial in a in a, in a practical application context. So I'm not talking about now theory right now. And so um, um, the cost of developing the model in OWL would be higher, especially not just that it's expressive uh, model and you use if you want to use it, but the fact that if you start modeling, let's say, uh, constraint on the value which we can model in OWL, then 
how many of these entities for which you can do that? Are you going to do for all of them? Or range of the values that you can specify, for example. Are you going to be all doing all of them? Or are you going to uh, say the type of relationship, whether, you know, uh, uh, you know, you look at ER diagram and N to M or 1 to N, that kind of stuff. So, if you're going to, so A, the cost will be very high. B, having modeled that then, you have an obligation to use it in your computation. Mm -hmm. So, while in RDF, when you're not modeling that, it's something not part of your computation, that computation will be, even though it's not easy, and it's, you know, this itself is a fairly, you know, complex, can be complex, because graph or computation is complex, and not polynomial necessarily, that one will be much more, uh, you know, time consuming. On the um, end, then what happens is that, what are you ultimately trying to do? Are you trying to, um, are, are, do you have ability to take the world, that you're modeling and model it in extensive and sufficient detail that this is complete. Then, if so, then you are, can do all this reasoning inferencing and you can give all the derived information that is not explicitly stated. That is the primary value of, for that. Uh, is that important? And that um, uh, the or is a computation whereby you are going from one node to another node to another node and that itself with the human interpretation because what happens is that with RDF you won't be able to model everything for example of the domain even with the owl you can't you remember because owl is ultimately dn is a subset of first order itself is and we can show long number of that can be not model using first order either so there's always going to be something out, kept outside the model, yeah. and how that is to be dealt with by human. Yeah. Ultimately, looking at the results, forming the codings that assume certain things, and so on and so forth. So, in uh, in, in in many situations, uh, in my personal view, uh, how could you deal with you know a little value? And there are yet another circumstances. For example. When you are trying to, so, so when there is a data and metadata and annotation and computation of that, I think RDF is where I will use. The other situations, for example, where you want to do the we'll best to capture expert knowledge, you might as well capture that using uh, you know, the more pieces of what you
Because many of these have now billions and billions of the you know tax. So because we are in this people in fact become very large. If I make a uh, hundred sensor work for one day and collect every piece of observation they collect, I think I'm easily, you know, in billions, right, of observations. So, um, uh, the, uh, for those who are more practical minded, the biggest challenges are in the understanding and addressing the issues of solving, uh, uh, you know, scalability and performance of uh, RDF data sets. So, this database related problem, really. Uh, for, unfortunately, the pure uh, traditional database world has not, uh, you know, done sufficient, you know, a lot of work in that. Now they are starting to think about it. Um, but when you get back to the database, then uh, you, you realize that uh, a lot of answers of that kind comes from engineering. There's just no, you know, uh, there's no silver bullet per se that will take care of all your um, scalability issue in, uh, uh, you know, any data management. Uh, let alone RDA data management. Uh, there was the last issue, not the coming one, but the last issue of this I, uh, IGS, WIS, the journal that I edit, was on uh, scalability of RDA. So those of you who, are, who think that they need to be a little bit more familiar with RDA should get the copy of that issue and certainly uh, read about Berlin benchmark and study that further. And uh, you know, there is also Matt, uh, at least one paper of that uh, issue is relatively practical and what you are doing if you are going to get uh, uh, into RDF uh, you know, processing in any serious way. So, uh, <coughs> what is also um, interesting is that in a, at least medium term, shorter term, when you talk about reasoning per se, let's say our based reasoning or inferencing, compared to that, uh, there is a kind of uh, you know, the reasoning uh, of sort of specialized kind that are far more uh, uh, clear in their value or in SSI. And they particularly include a location-based, uh, you, know, you know, reasoning, you may call reasoning, this is a sort of computation that essentially express, express location because there are a lot of location-based applications. And you know, a lot of things that goes on iPhone and everything, these are location-based. And, and then the time and other things. So one of the interesting things that we've been doing, and that I think what Pratik is going to take on, right? no, 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 it's no, for you. Sparkle. His third part will be with that actually. Yeah. So, just so I'm, I'm drinking from a fire hose here a little bit, so I'm absorbing this, but. Um, and you hit on something that's interesting and kind of leads to my question. Okay, so let's say I have a, I mean, go back to the simple thing. I have an author, a publisher, just published by. Mm -hmm. How do I get, so I have to create triples for, like, if you guys are all authors and you've all wrote 15 books and we're two publishers, if we're going to put that in there, I mean, how do you create those triples? Do you, I mean, you have, is there, does one of these tools help me create those automatically? Do I have to, I mean, I'm sure you don't do it manually, but uh, yes, it's okay. kind of back to the day in the life, and maybe we want to hold off on that, but that's, that's where I'm just confused. A lot of what Ajit was talking about yesterday is okay. um, taking data from the web, right? So that's a fast resource of yeah. information that's already there, and adding metadata so we can extrapolate <coughs> these facts automatically. Okay. So let me give you a few examples of how they are being created. Mm -hmm. Ajit yesterday mentioned that uh, he, you know, he talked about RDFA, RDF annotation, right. which in, can, in essence, is RDF. Uh, you know, so there, uh, the, today, if you want to have your web page go up high on search engine, uh, one of the best things you can do is to actually annotate your web page using RDFA, because search engine is using that. Uh, and um, uh, based on that, you get so. So what happens is that suddenly, a lot of people, uh, you uh, there's a huge business on search engine optimization and things of that nature. You might be aware of it. Suddenly, number That's of people smart. are looking at or are doing annotations of this data. Here, original create of individual triple is human, but uh, a crawler can go through all of them and collect and create massive amount of RDA. That's one example, and that's the kind of thing that uh, I mean. Another example is that practically anything that you may already have in the national database like maybe can be an idea. So why would you do that? So take a two, take a two column, and uh, you know that there is a particular relationship with this column. But relational model does not allow you to express that. You have to express that directly through the join that you are doing. 
which is a particular meaning. You really a joint for a particular reason. That is a relationship. That can be, that here will be explicitly modeled. So it is uh, anything that where you are doing a join in relational database can be exploited more straightforwardly by naming the relationship or joint computation and uh, converting to RDFA process. And this, and, and there are a number of things you may ask why you may do that. There may be multiple reasons for that. Uh, today, um, uh, the RDF data management technology is maturing very quickly. But relational database has been a long time, you know, so, so there are some engineering, heavy duty engineering work that has been done by Oracle and many other, you know, database vendors. So there is not quite, they are getting there soon. But, right off the bat, mm -hmm. the, because yeah, predicate is a URI, because something of the, the, you know, uh, so not really, uh, some, uh, you know, some subject uh, is a URI, and this thing, yeah. these are all web objects, that means the data structure is going on. With the, the code. That means your data is web based, not a table in a database. Can you get me water? So that is yet another reason why you may want to go there because it's, you uh, there's one somebody has the data, somebody has the data, they have the made web accessible, class. they have web services, they have XML, then they can show it to RDF. So suddenly you have this web centric database thing and again you may want to go to RDF. But if I want to capture that data to make sure that that, doesn't, that website doesn't go down or something happened to it, then I just capture it into my own database, but then I can just change my URI to be my database so that I still can Typically you don't do that, you can. But typically you don't do that because uh, this data base becomes so large. So he showed no. that he showed this uh, uh, link data cloud. Data cloud. Yeah, I understand that. But I mean, I'm looking at our application where we have, you know, you have some sensors going off somewhere, and you're going to need to show that to somebody at a later point in time. Uh, then you, yeah. So in that okay. case, we obviously so the billion people that we have created, they, these guys are right now in the process of putting. They've already put some of them onto that link data cloud. Right. These are sensor data that we have created that we are putting on the link data cloud. You will be storing that and it will link to some other data like geocode data somewhere else or DVPDI entry somewhere else. Okay. So people from there can come to explicitly instance data of suppose there is a geo, suppose somebody looks at that geocode and say what information is available for this location. And it may be possible for them to then someone across say, oh there is a sensor data available for that location. It may come from here. And we'll show you later on um, the workflow we actually go through. So we have sources of sensor data, and we collect that um, in particular formats and convert it into RDF and then allow you to query this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that'll come to you. And if we have an existing database though already, would, is the idea that we would convert that whole thing into RDF and just have that? Or do we have both? Or can you have RDF just <coughs> complement the data that's already in it? So there's, there's lots of groups looking at um, how to actually convert these database type representations to RDF representations. So, so, uh, so um, uh, there is a, uh, we are a member of the Worldwide Consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pratik uh, at, attends regularly this Sparkle thing that he is going to talk about now. Other student, uh, Satya, who gave a talk yesterday, he is a leading member of, uh, and he is the first author of a a uh, paper, or uh, you know, survey paper as well as a paper on um, conversion of RD, uh, 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 RDB to RDF. Okay. So, so how do you do that, and how do you do that in a very uh, you know rapid manner and, and correctly, and all that kind of stuff? And what are the tools Is and all that? Is there a middle ground though, where you can have the data in the right. database but have the relationship stored? Right. Yes. Ontologically, so, so you could reason it and then just go get the data that corresponds. Yes, as I was telling you yesterday, in Oracle you can actually combine the SQL processing and Spark processing uh, at the same time. Oh, sure. okay. So yes, you exactly can do that. Okay. Uh, coming back to complete the answer, the question you asked, I gave you two uh, major parts of how RDF created, that is not very really important part. So one was that people annotate and you get it from there. Right. Second was you can come from the traditional data which is like RDBI. Right? Right. And the third one is that 90% uh, of the corporate data is in text data. 80 to 90% is in text data. And uh, there is a whole bunch of um, uh, science or research in um, understanding what is called information extraction. So from the text data, understand what is an entity, what is a relationship. So automatically extracting, uh, you know, uh, entity relationship, and that means a triple, right? Entity relationship, entity. That's a triple, right? And so you can go through all the unstructured data. Uh, example: assumed data is a text data, like a scientific literature. Or it is an experimental data like mass spectroscopy or any machines like that that create a digital uh, proprietary digital formats of data. But from that you can create a structured data, semi-structured data, and uh, this kind of uh, and 
here that so again huge amount of data can be created from unstructured data into this data forms and you can have that. So this is, these are the ways why the data is uh, exploding. One, I'll end with one really powerful example. There is something called LODD, which is massive data sets of all drug databases. So, you know, all the data from multiple sources came, you know, have been brought together and put it on the LODD. So many, many holders of drug related databases, pharmaceutical drugs I'm talking about, are put up on the, uh, online by uh, several organizations working together. And certain governments have made already regulation, including US government, but more so in Europe, where they are asking the, the their uh, you know, uh, data providers to provide the data in our way. So right there, there is also policy and government push to make the data available so that the data is more machine usable, not just human data. Um, to add to it, as for example, the entire statistical information about Europe is available on the Link Data Cloud. It's called Eurostat. So you can just use it. And, and the other thing is, a lot of these data sets which you saw on the Link Data Cloud, they're still present in their uh, database format, but people have written wrappers on top of these uh, databases. So they can export the information as and when you need it. But the coffee is not totally cold, so if you <laughs> want to take it now, it was a bit cold. Uh -huh. So what we saw in the past hour or so is uh, we'll be running out of time. So I don't know. Uh, we'll do the best we can. <laughs> because after this, there is another one. Which one? The STT stuff. This is just sparkle and after that. Is I think we can just uh, give them an overview of uh, STD and come back. OK. Because uh, <coughs> You know, uh, I think that is STD is very relevant to what they want uh, they need to do, but uh, just giving the concept this is doable is good enough rather than how we are doing it. Okay. And then, where's, you know, basic familiar with RDF is anyway necessary. Mm -hmm. or is Both necessary. these things are necessary for that. Then, um, uh, where's we do the project, we can quickly have yet another uh, uh, meeting. You know, meeting and talk just for that. For maybe not all four of them need to be there, maybe two of them will be there. Okay. So we'll just do that. Okay. So what we saw in the past hour or so was just the representation of information, but without the ability to query that information, that information is almost useless. So what we are going to look uh, over here is the query language, which is used for most of the semantic web languages and technologies. So how do we access the information that was represented in RDF or OWL? Um, querying information, very, very simple querying information. <coughs> Can a certain RDF graph, is it possible to derive it from a certain data? Let's say that I have all the information related to uh, the Wright State University in the form of a graph. Is it possible to figure out who are the PhD students from that particular graph? How do you get this particular information? Well, in OWL, you can probably, I mean, you can do limited amount of things. Like, you can try to figure out subclass relationships, instances. Same thing in, is possible even in RDF. Um, but, I mean, even those, they will require a lot of processing of the data, figuring out the axioms and all that. And only after that, you'll be able to do it. So what we need is, um, we need some kind of a query language. Now, the query language should have support for good amount of expressivity to be able to express anything which is captured in the graph. And at the same time, it should have well-grounded semantics. If I include a particular term in a specific position, then it should mean that particular thing. If there is a particular term which is querying for subject, then it should query for the subject and not the property or the object. Uh, there is, but the moment you add in large expressivity, like everything, there is a trade-off. The moment you have large expressivity, it makes the system slower and slower. And then um, there, it, there becomes restrictions and ma on manipulation of data and um, a lot of people, they want the results in the form of a table, but if the information is present in the form of a graph, how do you do those kind of things? And um, the basic motivation for RDF was to make information more machine readable. So even the queries and the results should be in a way possible for machines to interpret. And whatever results are being returned back, they should be inferred by the machines. So the basic language, or the, the most popular language, or 
I should say the only language which is traditionally used for querying of any of these semantic web um, uh, technologies such as RDF or OWL. It's called Sparkle. It's spelled as S-P-A-R-Q-L, but people call it Sparkle. And it's a reverse acronym for Sparkle Protocol and RDF Query Language. It's something like GNU, uh, again, reverse protocol, uh, reverse acronyms and so on. It is a W3C specification since uh, January 15, 2008. Um, like I mentioned, it is one of the most popular query language for RDF documents. And nowadays, if you do any kind of research or any kind of work related to RDF, people expect the query language to be Sparkle and not anything else. It has been uh, successful to a larger extent. A lot of the uh, data sets which we saw in the previous presentation on the linked data cloud, they have started exposing uh, Sparkle endpoints so that you can query all that information. As for example, um, like the entire data set of Wikipedia, which is exported in RDF as DBpedia, is, it's possible to query that entire data set. Same thing for the, the European statistical information, which I said. Same thing for a lot of the geographical information present in GeoName, CIA Factbook, and so on. It's possible to query all that information using publicly available Sparkle endpoints. And you can even write your own code to query any of these data sources. Um, now, there are a few drawbacks which were like any language. Sparkle has been going, uh, I mean, people realize there are a few drawbacks related to it. So the W3C, it formed a new working group since February 2009. I'm a part of that working group, and we have every weekly meetings related to it to discuss what are the issues which we should be addressing and so on. Uh, parts of the Sparkle specification, like all the W3C standards, so there is a particular document which describes the syntax and semantics of Sparkle. The query language, which we will be uh, looking at over here, then the result format, because what you are you what you will be getting in the form of a result is basically a graph so encoding of that particular graph becomes an important issue now like i mentioned there are a lot of these publicly public data sets which allow the results to be exported so definitely there is an issue of sending these queries over a network and getting the result back from these <coughs> endpoints so what you need is also a protocol, which is pretty much built on top of HTTP, to be able to send these queries and get the results back from uh, these endpoints. To give you an example of a very simple Sparkle query, if you guys are familiar with SQL, then it should be fairly straightforward to understand. Shouldn't be a lot of problem. So over here, basically what is being looked for is uh, the variables, which are represented using this question mark. So this is a query which is querying for the title and the author of a book which is published by a specific publisher. Now the variables are represented in, um, in Sparkle using question marks or the other alternative is a dollar sign. So you can either put a question mark or a dollar sign over here and get the information. And what you are specifying over here is identical to what is the where clause in SQL queries. So over here, we are basically saying that I am interested in the title and author of books which are published by CRC Press. The book has a specific title, and the book has a specific author. Now, um, because the language um, um, uh, using which we have encoded the information, it represents everything in the form of triples. So the query has to follow the same pattern as well. So even over here, query is expressed in the form of triples. So this is my first triple, which says that the book is published by a specific uh, publisher. Now, because not everything, um, no, no, sorry, I take that back. Now, because you need a specific publisher so it is like saying in a SQL query where publisher equals to in quotes CRC press. So any information where uh, you're looking for uh, things related to a specific entity, you put them um, their, their URIs or their values. And this is the property which, is, which should be present between the variable and the publisher over here. So here there is, the book is the variable, then there is a specific property published by and then here is the publisher. Now, because of the use of this particular property, which is the named relationship over here, it makes sure that whatever is coming back will be only a book and not a monkey or not a human being. Because in the schema or the information base, which is present over there, this property makes sure that it's 
domain is a book and not anything else. So even the information which will be returned back will be a book. Same thing goes on even for here. Now the thing is because we are, we are actually querying for the title and the author of the books. So unlike here where we were specifying a particular resource related to which we were uh, interested in getting the information, here even that remains a variable. So we are saying that there is a book which has some title and I'm interested in knowing that title. Then the book has an author and I'm interested in knowing that particular author. Um, now the main part of this query is this, this particular pattern which comes in, in the graph. Um, which like SQL forms uh, which is present in the where clause or the where pattern. This is also known as the basic graph pattern if, if you're going into the technical terms of that. And um, although this example doesn't capture set, but you can even have variables in the predicate positions. So you can have variables in the subject, predicate, and object position. Let's say if I'm interested in querying an entire graph. For some reasons, I want to query the entire graph. Then the only thing I have to do is where question mark x, question mark y, question mark z. That is going to give me all the triples which occur in that particular graph on which this query is being executed. However, if I replace any of these um, variables with a specific URI or a specific literal, then only the, the, the triples which are related to that particular instance will be returned back. Um, now again, like the RDF graph, um, in order to omit writing example.org everywhere where this property is being used, you can specify the prefix on the top. And this, the, RD, uh, the Sparkle processor will take care of making sure that this is interpreted like this, and it's going to look for it in the graph. And the results will be returned back for the variables which are specified in the select clause. Sure. Quick question, mm -hmm. and this might be coming up. But if we were just to use regular SQL, mm -hmm. you know, we can query with with values, right? Um, specific values only. So is the advantage to this the fact that you've got the entailment or the subclasses, or I mean, what what is what's the power here that goes above the regular SQL? Um. <sighs> One of the um, benefits which you will get is because the entire information is represented in the form of a graph. So let's say that um, over here, I was querying for um, titles which contain semantic web. Okay. So how will I write the same query? It will be book has title, title, title. Let's say there was a property called contains, and then there was I'll put in quote semantic web. If you have to do the same kind of query in SQL, I mean, I agree, it's possible to do it. But at the same time, the amount of information which you will have to write down to represent that particular SQL query, it's hard. Then second thing is, it's not as intuitive because the way in which the information is represented is in the form of triples. So for anybody who's writing the query, again, it becomes a lot easier to even have the query in, in that particular format only. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. I may be wrong here. Uh, but I'm Try to go to the intuitive level um, You see, um, relational database uh, uh, succeeded a lot with uh, separated computing um, and uh, regular structure of the data. Uh, that uh, generally, uh, compared to this idea, we use for more semantics in the application. With the relationship as a first class object, we have a bit more semantics in the model itself and the corresponding way to compute. So it's a very, uh, and, and you you may remember perhaps that there was a name of uh, another database technology called object oriented database technology. And the object oriented database technology, uh, there were some native object oriented database technology implementations whereby uh, the uh, link, uh, where they, they, they are linked is, so you are doing link traverses uh, with the object typing uh, to compute it rather than set computations, set of regardless computations that the relational database does. And uh, it was shown that in theory, um, uh, anyone in practice you can implement it right that uh, for querying the um, computer database, you need to implement the same thing better. Because of a lot of reasons, such as business reasons, as well as uh, 
database is not just the scoring and its uh, performance, but there's a lot of other things that come with database that other companies were simply not uh, able to invest enough to compete with uh, the relational database vendor to become a viable business as well. This is a little bit new ball game, and we are in an environment where um, now there are more than 20, well, it's not more, open source implementers are here. And a lot of sort of innovations happen outside of the companies per se. And so, um, uh, it, it, you know, here you are going to, uh, you are able to do a better implementation for the thing that you can model in relation uh, RDF, uh, RDF using this with the direct uh, addressing of the predicates as opposed to you, you are having to do it with a lot more of the extra code that will be necessary to be in uh, SQL. And yeah, to add to actually what Dr. Shade just said, um, let's say if I have to specify that there is a published by relationship which is present between two entities. Uh, I'm not sure how you're going to model that in SQL. Um, this is the best exa example I can think of. Like if I had a regular relational table, uh -huh. I might have um, a bunch of different animals and might have the animal name, characteristics, and then I have, might have to have a column that says it's an animal, it actually says it's an animal. Mm -hmm. If I use this, <laughs> because of the relationships, can I just write a query and say select all the mammals? But because it knows what a mammal is, it goes and grabs the um, grabs all the dogs, right. all the cats, all the kangaroos. But I didn't have to explicitly say in the data that they are mammals. Is that what you can do is you can, if you have something like an RDF type which you have used for representing the class of all mammals, you can just specify one triple that. Um, X is an animal, which is of type mammal. But because it knows that all these different types of animals are all mammals, it will just grab them without right. me. Because in SQL, I would have to explicitly say... That uh, they should have these particular properties right. in order for them to be mammals. And I would have had to literally store for every record that they were, in fact, mammals. Exactly. So the amount of information which you have to store becomes less, and uh, even the, the length of the query also becomes less and all that. Uh, that, that's correct. Um, what you're actually saying is the that's, that's a difference, right? right? To say that a kangaroo is a <coughs> member. So that being the student information. So it's a bit beyond just the query of the RDF itself. It could be if that inference is not explicitly made. Um, but there are strides being made within the query itself to be able to do things like that. They are so trying to do They are trying to come up with something which is called an entailment regime within Sparkle itself. So to support a lot of the, uh, the owl-related things which you see, uh, how is it possible to do it within Sparkle? Because Sparkle, if you, as you'll see later on, it has uh, a lot of drawbacks with respect to that. So they are trying to address that along with a lot of the update-related operations. Could you do that today, though, with Sparkle? Like a simple... <sighs> Not really. Okay. Well, you do it with the combination. Yeah. So you have you know, a simple RDF with your RDF data. So what? Simple inference, and you run yeah. the query on the inferred triples as well as the triples that we have. Precisely. So what you do is you run some kind of a reasoning engine before, and then your queries are run on top of that. <coughs> uh, so let's say if we have um, again, this is. Um, a simple, um, the, the, the execution of that query, if there was a simple document, this is encoded again in total format, that there is a book called Semantic Web which is published by so-and-so publisher. It has a particular title and there are these three authors. So the execution of that query can be represented in the form of tables. It can be also represented as triples. It can be also represented as graph. Over here, what they have shown is in the form of table. So what it does is that for the variable title and author, it constructs these two columns, title and author. And uh, for every author, it represents that there is a particular book, Foundations of Semantic Web Technologies, and there is a particular author for that, and so on. So by this keyword, the variable book should have semantic web. Uh, can you repeat that? There is a variable book. Uh -huh. So that should be semantic web, but why do you do it? Uh, over here, I mean, you can have another chunk which says it is foundations of geographical web technologies. So then it will even return back that information as long as the publisher is the same. Because here the constraint was that we are looking for books which are published by a particular publisher. So it doesn't matter what is the title of the book. 
Oh, okay. Uh, now coming back to the question of what do blank nodes, uh, which we were looking at RDF means. Now blank nodes in a query pattern, you can put them in a, in the subject position or you can put them in the object position. But they behave like variables that cannot be selected. By that, what I mean is you cannot have them over here. Your processor will either uh, yeah, sparkle. Can you, can you ask, uh, say, uh, can, can a blank node have multiple literals associated with them? It can, but you so cannot can you have ask, it. Can you ask all of them, uh, give me all of them? You can ask all the literals which are associated with the blank node, but what you, what you cannot query is the blank node itself. Well, yeah. okay. But you can query all the literals associated with it. Uh, the blank node ID, uh, most of these RDF encoding uh, format, uh, tools, they assign some particular blank uh, IDs to every, uh, every blank node which is present over there. So, uh, like Dr. Shed said, that if, let's say, there is a blank node number one, it, it can have ten particular literals, so there is a particular ID. But it's almost irrelevant. And in uh, any particular thing, it should not be asked, like, uh, that particular thing should not occur more than once per query. Otherwise, it can lead to all kinds of issues. Your processor will complain and so on. And they are placeholders for unknown elements. And then... Um, ID is arbitrary, but it may indicate relationship between results, as it's captured over here. Like, there is a particular blank node, which is A, which has a particular uh, literal associated with 4. Then there is uh, another blank node, B, which has thing associated with it called example. Now, over here, um, like, it has two literal values for an example. So when you query for it, it's going to return back this, the thing. Uh, the graph patterns, in order to put them together, these uh, curvy brackets are used. So if I have to say that the book is published by so-and-so and then the book has a particular title, in order to make it one composite graph pattern, what I do is I put them in one, uh, a pair of these parentheses. And this becomes a separate graph pattern and so on. Uh, the use, it's a bit uh, difficult to visualize over here, but there are additional constructs in Sparkle. There are things like optional union and so on, where the use of these parentheses becomes more apparent uh, as to why you will need to group specific graph patterns. Like I was mentioning, so there are things such as optional which you can specify. So what optional means is that uh, in a particular graph, now Sparkle, the way in which it tries to find out the answers is that it does a strict matching of these things with the graph. So what it's going to do is that it's going to look for property published by in the graph. And what is the subject? It is captured for book. And the object should be crc-press.com slash URI. The moment it tries to, the Sparkle processor finds that, it's going to return it back to you. Now, if let's say there was another pattern which was present over here, that there is a book, title, title. What happens if in case this particular property is not satisfied for this subject, which is the book? What happens in those cases? If the graph looks like this, however, this particular property is not satisfied in the, in the RDF model, then no information will be returned. How do I avoid that? I avoid that by putting the title in the optional pattern. So even if there is no information related to the title of the book present in the graph, still it will return all the information related to this particular book and publish um, if there is a particular publisher for that. So um, as for example that there is a book two for which there is no author information available, so what it does is it does not return back anything. It, it returns back the other information which it can find, but this particular thing is left blank over here. Any questions? Uh, now, just like in SQL, you have the union operator. So even in Sparkle, what they do is they provide something which is called um, a union operator, which is, which is almost identical. So what it does is that it's going to provide you with the union of uh, the two patterns. So let's say somebody created a pretty bad graph, and what he did was he ended up using two different properties 
to represent the author of a particular uh, of books. So in one case, he ended up using author, and the other case, he ended up using writer. But I want the entire information. So what I can do is I can write book has author, author, book has union with, book has writer, writer. And when it computes the results, it's going to create a union of both the graphs and return back the information to me. Um, so in this particular case, where the graph is slightly more complicated than what we have seen till now, here is a, a, a triple pattern which we see. There is a book which is published by CRC Press. Then we specify another graph pattern, which is oh, its own independent graph pattern because of the use of these parentheses, that there is a book which has a specific author. I'm doing a union of it with another pattern, which is the book has a writer who's again an author because of the use of a different property. And then maybe that the author, um, the information about the author, uh, the last name of the author is present or it may not be present. So what is the interpretation of this particular statement? Does it mean that it's a union of these two uh, with an optional pattern added to it? or it's a union of two patterns, the second of which has an optional pattern associated with it. The, in this particular case, the first operation, the first interpretation is actually correct. It's the union of these two patterns with an optional condition attached to it. So what it's going to do is it's going to compute the union of these two. It will try to find if it can find more information about the author, which is the surname information. If it cannot find it, it's fine. It will return back an empty result for that. If it can find it, then it will also include the surname information for that particular author. So if you have to write it more clearly, then this is the correct way or the more clear way of writing this particular information. That is, there is a book which is published by CRC Press. Then again, you create a graph pattern. There is an author, union it with the writer, and then you specify the optional. So it makes it more clear. So the way in which you write your query, it also kind of makes an impact because uh, anybody else who's looking at the query, like any other language, it, it, it helps them in understanding the query. Now the optional pattern, it refers to exactly one pattern which is grouped to the right. And option and union expressions, they are left associative. And there is no set precedence, like unlike in mathematics where there is a particular precedence between operators. Over here, there is no set precedence. There is uh, also some discussion in the Sparkle Working Group related to defining of these precedents and how these things should be done and so on. Uh, to give you an example, in this particular case, there is a subject, predicate, and object, SPO. Then there is a particular optional SPO. Then there is a union. Then again, there is an optional. Then again, there is an optional. It means the following. There is a graph pattern SPO, which has an optional SPO, uh, uh, S2, P2, O2, which the, the result of these two is, is it's, um, it's participating in a union operation with S3, P3, O3, which goes in for the optional, which goes in on another optional. So it's, it's read like this. Um, let's say if you want to figure out all students in Wright State University whose age is less than 30. So how do you do that? Just like in uh, SQL, you can specify where age is equal to or less than um, 30. Similar thing can be done even in Sparkle. What you can do is you can write the pattern and then you use something which is called a filter. What filter does is that filter performs or removes those results which do not match the condition specified over here. And you can even do conjunction of these two conditions. That um, you can say that the price of the book should be less than 17, and make sure that the book is not a blank node. So what it's going to do is it's going to make sure that any book which is uh, between uh, $0 to $17 is returned, and the book has a particular URI attached to it. And like I said, results which do not match a particular filter are, are removed from the final results which are displayed to you. Um, it is almost as rich as SQL with respect to the filter functions. 
uh, you can do all kinds of comparison equals to greater than less than greater than equal to and so on you can do arithmetic operations that is plus minus and so on so you can even do 2 plus 3 4 plus 5 and so on you can even do boolean um, operations like the and operation or operation and so on and uh, then there are certain RDF specific functions you can find more details in the RDF uh, sparkle spec that is checking if it's a particular entity is a literal or if it's a resource what is the language is it English sure is the RDFS like expressive enough that um you could say like adult child and adult is anyone between greater than 18, child is between 10 and 18, infant is between such and such, so that when you ran that query you could say where you know, age is child or age is adult. Yeah. No. Mm. That's an hour thing. The examples you've given are at least for numerical operators, right? yeah. greater than and less than. <clears throat> so, Incorporating that into um, logical entailments is, is something that's kind of not done. Right? So you can use Boolean operators, like, you know, lots of Boolean operators like and, or, you can use existential operators, universal operators, these kind of things that are traditionally logic based, but not numerical operators. But in, okay, <coughs> with your OWL, like with your weather system, you can say select where it's freezing rain and you've quantified what freezing rain is without the user having to know what freezing rain is derived from, right? Right, so what um, what happens is, so the logics we've been talking about so far have been kind of schema level based on these representation languages. Um, but also you can define other rules, <coughs> business rules, like first order logic rules, um, which have you know, built in to do some sort of numerical um, comparisons. Uh, and we do that. So, on top of the reasoning that's done by these languages, we add additional rules to these things. Okay, here's what I find. So, uh, so there's no precedence of operators uh, in any of these you know, that well, I mean, so if there are, you start combining these things, then it shows some kind of a precedence. But if it's an optional, then, I mean, it's basically saying that only to the right. Other than that, I mean, there is no specific precedent. What, what, what do you, about the precedent between logical and logical? Uh, I think that should typically follow the precedence which is associated with Boolean mathematics. Oh, it does? There is precedence. There is precedence over there, but these are all sparkle constructs. Oh. So between sparkle constructs, they are not sure. Oh. But between those Boolean constructs which follow the normal laws of mathematics, oh. of course. Uh, the way in which it works, or uh, sparkle which I said, is it's based on a matching simple graph patterns, which is the strict matching, which is uh, one of the drawbacks which is associated with Sparkle as of now because it cannot do entailments and all those kind of things which is being looked upon. You can do grouping, optionals, and alternatives, the kind of things you can do with SQL. You can use filters to filter out the results which you do not want or which you want. And what you can also do is, like in SQL we have order by and group by kind of operations. Same thing you can do even in Sparkle by using things like order by it. There is a particular age, uh, I want only the top 10 results, and the offset is 5. So I want all the results which are starting at 5, and I'll probably go to 15. And what you can also do is, you can, um, like I was mentioning before, there are various ways in which the output can be exported. You can export the uh, output in the form of a table. You can also export it as an RDF XML graph, which we saw in the previous presentation. So it depends on you what kind of output you want. If you want to construct a graph, you can use the Sparkle um, function called construct, and it will construct an art entire graph for you. Uh, when you write code in any of the languages, like um, Java or something, then um, there are a lot of libraries which are available for processing of Sparkle. Again, there is one, uh, the more popular one is something called Arc, which is again by HP Labs Bristol. Um, so they uh, they give you all kinds of options for exporting your results and processing of these queries. Um, so there are uh, the informal meaning of all these queries. They often leave a lot of questions like, what kind of results can I expect from my queries? How should my particular software behave? Because some of the questions are left unanswered. Um, then is my product Sparkle confirmed? One thing which you will notice is. Um, 
there are various implementations for Sparkle. Like I mentioned, there's one which is called Arc. There is a lot of compatible. There are some some compatibility issues which are present between various implementations. Um, but again, I mean, it the 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 differences are not that significant that it should bother you from using it. Uh, but there are certain functions which are provided by a particular vendor which may not be available with somebody else. For computer scientists like us, most of us are worried about what could be the worst case complexity of Sparkle. Uh, <coughs> I think I can skip this particular portion because it's mapping up to Sparkle as well. So probably if there are any questions related to Sparkle, because this is pretty much the basic thing which you'll need to know about Sparkle. Corey, which, which room, um, product or technology or these in conjunction with Sparkle that you mentioned? So within the application we, um, we use a tool called Jenna. So uh, okay. this HP Bristol um, Arc application you just mentioned is made by the same company. And so it actually works within the Jenna framework. Um, so yeah, it's a Smith web application, and they have their own um, <coughs> rule language and rule engine. Yeah. We use that. In fact, uh, Tomah here did a lot of that work okay. recently. So if we have time, we'll get into some of those. Yes. The, if you are more interested in like <laughs> processing Sparkle using um, any of the web development languages like PHP and all that. There is even support for that. Like in PHP, there is another um, Sparkle processing library, which is also called ARC, which is, but it's ARC. So you can execute Sparkle queries using that. And same thing, I think, is available even for JavaScript as well, some limited functionality. Who developed Sparkle? Who developed Sparkle? Uh, Sparkle is developed by the working, working group. Process. There is an entire big group of people. <laughs> oh, so it's not like a university or a person. No, it is the same world, but there are companies in um, HP is one of those companies, then um, there are um, um, there is a big semantic web research lab in Oxford. They are involved in this particular effort. Then our lab is involved. So, so this presentation is probably related to the work which we do in the lab related to the spatial and spatial temporal and thematic analysis of data. Um, so let's say if you have um, any statement that says that there is North Korea detonated a particular device on so-and-so date near so-and-so location. So if you look at this particular statement, it has three aspects to it. One is what exactly happened. So over here, the, the, the information that North Korea captured, uh, North Korea detonates nuclear device is the what part, that is the thematic dimension. Then there is the other aspect, which is when it happened, which is October 9, 2006. And then there is a spatial dimension, where. So any statement which captures the general information like this will have three of its components. Now, because uh, we have been talking about modeling information using RDF and all that, so um, using name relationship, it becomes possible to connect all these thematic entities with the spatial information which is available. So if there is, uh, um, let's say we want to capture information about Second World War, then we can say that uh, there is a particular soldier who is assigned to a specific military unit. The military unit participated in a battle which occurred at a specific spatial region which can be captured using its coordinates. And then, again, in order to capture more spatial information, you can also assign additional information that the soldier lives at so-and-so address, and the military unit participates in so-and-so location, and so on. And all this information can be captured. Now, there are three different kinds of entities which are seen over here. One is the name places, the places which have a specific name, like addresses, and so on, um, which, are, which are going to be there. Then there is something which, which are called spatial occurrence, like battles. They occur at a particular location or any particular event, like the G20 summit or the Olympic bidding process. They happen at a particular location. And then there are dynamic entities which can move around, like a person who occupies a house may move out of the house and somebody new can come in. So those kind of things are called the dynamic entities. So we can capture all this information using the RDF graphs. 
uh, now the graph which we saw before that captured the spatial and the thematic entities but what about time how do I capture the time related to any particular event how do I say that the, the second world war happened somewhere in the 1940s so in order to do that what we can do is or to say that uh, a particular soldier was assigned to a particular platoon between um, uh, uh, 1st of January till 30th of November so what we can do is we can assign those properties to the graphs using what we looked at the reification uh, uh, reification related things uh, and because of all, all this information becomes available we can query that which soldiers were member of the platoon during so and so time interval now um, you can also query for overlapping information that who are the soldiers which were participating in some battle at the same time if you want to let's say do all kinds of analysis on them like which is it possible that there are there is a set of soldiers who what participated in a specific battle and got exposed to radiations and so on Like I mentioned, this this kind of analysis can become really helpful if, let's say, you want to do um, analysis for bioterrorism. Like there is a particular doctor who was assigned to a base which was uh, stationed at a particular uh, platoon, and so on. So any soldier which were present at the same location, at the same point of time, or participated in the same event, it becomes possible to do analysis as to what kind of things they might have suffered from, what were the events which happened over there, which can help us in uh, analyzing their behavior or something. Um, in all, um, one of the emerging areas um, the, where this thing is being heavily used are things like um, analysis of links between people. Like, I want to figure out what is the connection between the person who bought a large amount of cosmetics from some store in Colorado with somebody who lives in New York who, who was caught at the airport. If I want to figure out what is the relationship between them, RDF graphs are really helpful in those kind of scenarios because of the assignment of named relationships. So I can say that the person who lives in Colorado went to school um, at uh, Columbia and the person who was caught in New York was his classmate in Columbia at the same time. So using um, th these uh, RDF graphs and assigning spatial properties and temporal properties to it, it becomes a lot easier to do analysis. Um, this kind of summarizes what I was uh, talking about, like assigning name relationship and saying that this particular entity works for this organization which has a particular name and so on, so identification of links becomes easier. With that the data mm -hmm. mining you mentioned too, is that where the entitlement could come into play? Because you mm -hmm. have to facts Possible. Yeah. and it would, it would perhaps reveal Definitely. something that you didn't explicitly put in there? Definitely. That actually becomes one of the major areas, especially if you want to figure out like money laundering and those kind of activities. Um, now again, over in this particular graph, what we are trying to do is we are illustrating what are the spatial relationships which are present between entities and what are the um, thematic uh, relationships which are present between entities. Now again, thematic entities, to summarize, they, are, they're, they kind of represent what particularly happened. Um, now, although we are able to model all this information, again the question comes back to, is it possible to query all this information, or if I have to query, how do I query it? So let's say if I want to uh, execute a query that which military units have areas of operations which are within 20 miles of so and so coordinates in the context of a specific battle participation, or which infantry unit operated in overlapping areas so that some kind of a discussion happened between them for operations and so on. So in order to query all these things, um, which are uh, two different kinds of uh, relationships, one is a quantitative relationship, whereas the other one is a qualitative relationship. Now this one, uh, where we are talking about specific set of coordinates, that's a more quantitative relationships because you are talking about metric parameters such as latitude, longitudes, 20 miles, and so on. Whereas the other one, which is more like a set kind of a language where we're talking about overlaps and union. So how do I query for all these kind of things within one, one specific set of queries? 
similar kind of things can uh, be or similar scenarios are possible even in case of temporal information um, where we are talking about what were the speeches given by President Roosevelt within one day of a major battle or who were the members of a particular platoon within this particular time interval. Uh, what one of the, the, the work which we have done in the lab is that we are uh, defining domain independent ontology which can integrate information from different aspects, the spatial aspect, thematic aspects, and temporal aspects. Um, defining a domain independent ontology, what it allows us to do is it allows us to capture various scenarios. Now, the spatial, temporal, and thematic aspects of information exhibit across domains. It is not just limited to the battle participation. It's common in political field, it's common in biological field, and so on. So defining an upper level ontology for capturing this kind of thing helps us in uh, capturing all this information. And what it also allows us to do is it allows us to capture the temporal metadata into this model. And we can formalize basic spatial and temporal relationships. Um, we have defined operators which complement the current uh, operators which are uh, part of another project which we guys did. This is sort of the summary of what I was saying, uh, continuance and occurrence, that events happen and then they do not exist, like person moves into a house and then moves out. And then continuance are things which are going to keep on forever, like we can say that the sun always rises from the east, so that is something which is a continuance. the operators actually that's why I'm skipping some of these slides now the sparkle which we saw or the RDF model which we saw uh, querying in all these three different dimensions of spatial temporal and thematic it sort of becomes a bit problematic like how do I query for soldiers who are present within a particular area during this particular time interval when um, some explosion happened when you have to integrate all these three dimensions and perform some kind of a reasoning in um, spatial and temporal dimension, it becomes a bit difficult. So one of the things which we do in the lab is we have developed specific operators which can integrate these three different dimensions into one specific query. So the, uh, we can query, these, um, uh, query this information based on the properties and relationships between the regions where things happen, what time interval they happen, and what kind of things happen. To give you an example, like there is this uh, one operator which we have, which is called the spatial extent operator. What it does is that it allows in retrieval of the spatial um, region, which is connected to another spatial region by a specific relationship. Um, like what were the battles in which a particular uh, platoon uh, was involved. So what we can do is we can specify that what is the spatial extent of this particular division. And then you can even do things like uh, overlap and so on to figure out like what were the battles in which the 101st Airborne Division fought and what are the overlapping regions of this platoon with the, the 100th Airborne Division. These operators, they are actually extension to Sparkle, um, and a lot of the functionality which we use are provided by some of the standard implementations of Sparkle and databases. This, a lot of this work was actually done by Matthew Perry. He graduated from the lab, and he is working at Oracle Semantic Web Research right now. Um, similar kind of querying can be done even for um, information related to the temporal intervals. Like if I want to figure out who are the soldiers who are fighting during a particular time, and so that kind of querying can again be done using our operators. Like this particular one, which is the temporal intersect, where I'm trying to figure out if there was an intersection between the 
um, between two different operations, like which soldiers were member of first armored division at the same time. Then using this particular operator, what we can do is we can assign the values, and then um, like this, there is a soldier who was assigned to the first armored division, and it will help in returning back all the overlapping uh, time intervals. Uh, so, like I said, I mean the operators diff. They are in uh, different kinds of domains. One is the one for spatial, then the other one is the temporal. And spatial locate kind of um, helps you in figuring out where the entity, a particular entity, is located. Then evaluating uh, for evaluation, like are these two regions overlapping or they are completely distinct? That helps you with that. And similar kind of information is also available for temporal intervals. So this kind of gives the, the big picture of these intervals. Like if there is a more complex query, which is present, when did the first, when did the 101st Airborne Division came within 10 miles of another division in the context of battle participation? So what you're looking for is you're looking for information along two dimensions. One is the temporal information by asking when, and by specifying within 10 miles in context of battle participation. You're also specifying the spatial uh, overlapping regions between them. Quick question. Sure. These uh, different relationships were created. Mm -hmm. At some point, do they actually fall back into the database? I mean, because it's not all just going to be on strings. There could be a timestamp, or it could be like oracle spatial. Mm -hmm. At some level, does it eventually get down to where it's actually querying the right. areas, points, lines? It does. It does. So what, let's say if you want to figure out, um, uh, give me all battles which were fought in uh, at the border of United States and Canada. Let's say if you're querying for this particular thing. So what it can do is these operators can actually um, get, if the, the information about the coordinates and everything is present, it can actually go down and figure out that these are the regions which are present between United States and Canada and these are the battles which are fought in those areas. Uh, that's kind of summary of, uh, with respect to the spatial temporal thematic dimension, what we do in the lab. Um, there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to address it on site because we are already running out of time, so I have to skim through some.